everyone hello I've had a few requests for a tour of the workshop most recently from the UK Vintage Radio Forum so they've been quite nice about my work so <laughs> I'll show you around and those of you who've been following me for a while will know I don't just do electronics I'll have a go at anything so this end of the workshop is where the sort of dirty mechanical stuff happens and I keep the nice clean electronics uh, down there if we start from this end we've got the chop saw I've got a lightweight pillar drill and then of course there's a band saw and a milling machine. This metalworking lathe gets quite a lot of use making little custom parts and repairing stuff that's just out of true. And these are the placing chemicals for putting nice finishes on various metals. And below the bench it's a bit messy, ignore it for your welding machines and stuff like that. And various lotions and potions for finishing the woodwork on nice old things. And a rocking horse isn't typical of what I'm restoring but it needed a new head. Don't ask. But it's made a right mess of the workbench. Not happy about that. And then we've got the metal shears, we've got some components, uh, ultrasonic cleaner, and uh, the oven for drying. And a few chemicals and things. <laughs> then we've got the big pillar drill, which doubles as a coat rack. And now that brings us round to the workbenches. There's a blue one, and a grey one. I keep the common equipment in the middle. So I've got the soldering stations and the microscope there, and they'll actually can be used either side. Now because I'm into a bit of everything, I keep quite a variety of equipment. So I've got stuff that's uh, audio frequency equipment, I've got RF equipment, uh, and just lots of power supplies. There's a little one hiding up there which will keep as a spare. I've got this dual power supply, this is a TTI EX752M. This one's great for testing the higher power amplifiers, because you can wind this up to 75 volts each side, or 150 volts in series, pretty good. Then another one here, this is a QL564T power supply, a triple power supply. What I like about this one is you can actually set the voltage to millivolts, which is really useful for doing some tests. And then another TTI, this is a PL303QMDP. This is a great little linear power supply, very stable. It's one of my favourites. And if I need even more voltage, I have these old HP power supplies, a 6209B, that'll take me to 320 volts. And I've got another one up there just in case I need more than that. Then I have this Keithley high voltage supply which gives 1200 volts on the very rare occasion you need to exceed even that. And hiding up the top is a bit of a monster. This is an HP 6012B. This is a 1000 watt power supply which can go up to either 50 amps or 60 volts. Uh, not at the same time mind you. I also have a couple of these single channel power supplies which are great if you need a bit more power and not much space. Now after power supplies, the next thing I look at is the signal generators. Now hiding right in the corner, because it doesn't get used that much, is an HP 8112A. This is a pulse generator. It's a little bit cryptic to use, but when you need a fast pulse, or a control pulse, with rising edge control, <laughs> this is the tool for the job. Then I have a universal counter, an HP 5334B. I don't know how fast it is, it's probably a good few megahertz, and it's plenty fast enough for me. And at the bottom there is an LCR meter, a HP 4274A. And there's this curve tracer, it's a Tektronix 576. Very useful for checking transistors out. Another signal generator is the HP 3314A, one of the first ones I had. And this one's a bit newer, so this is an Agilent brand, it's a 33120A. 15 megahertz arbitrary waveform generator, so it does quite a few shapes, quite clever. And this is one of the newer bits of equipment I've got, the Keysight brand. All the same stuff, just renamed. So this is the 34460A, a really nice multimeter. Then there's a Keithley 236 source measure unit. Quite old, but a good one. I have the output from this on a pair of flying leads, so I can just connect it to any components I want to measure and work out what the voltage drop is. And there are other things like that, it's quite a versatile tool. Then we've got the big oscilloscope here, this is a Tektronix DPO7254, 2.5 gigahertz bandwidth, it's quite an animal, but it takes ages to boot up.
and finally it's ready for use. <laughs> what a thing. I developed a few power supplies over the years and I had to have electronic loads for testing them. So I started with a small one, a 350 watt unit from Array, which is a great unit. I had to upgrade to this 2.4 kilowatt unit, which is a bit of an animal. And sitting above it is a dual channel elliptical filter. These aren't very common, I don't think. But these are great when you're working on circuits that need a bit of filtering and you don't know where to start. This is occasionally useful. This is basically an op-amp in a box. It's a Tektronix AM501. It's got a good range to it. Here we have an AM502, a differential amp, which is yeah, sort of a similar thing. And here we've got an SG505 oscillator. Very low distortion on this. This is an Agilent 34970A data acquisition switch. It's basically a multimeter with many, many channels. You wouldn't want one normally. And this is a digital phase shift meter. If you want to know accurately what your phase shift is, <laughs> that's the tool. And here we've got a dynamic signal analyzer. This is a two channel model and it does up to 100 kilohertz. So ideal for audio and mechanical stuff, which I suppose audio is. Uh, this is an HP 35660A. And here's a portable isolated oscilloscope, which is great for measuring modern amplifiers with these HBJ outputs, like these Class D switching ones. And of course behind it is hidden another classic. This is the Tektronix 2465, one of the finest analog scopes made, they reckon. This might get a bit more of an airing in the future, you never know. Oh, I think there's an old Rigol scope in here, yes. Just in case, spare one. And of course there's a couple more bench meters here. We've got an Agilent 34450A, which is a five and a half digit multimeter. And next to it is the classic HP 34401A. And this is my favorite signal generator. This is the HP 8904A. This is a very versatile piece of kit. One of its best features is it actually has four different generators in there, channels A, B, C and D. And you can direct them to any of the two outputs. And of course these can be floating outputs, so this is great for doing balanced outputs. Now you've got a spectrum analyzer for low frequency stuff. This one does about 100 kilohertz, but it's ideal for audio stuff. So again, HP 3580A, measuring a 5 kilohertz signal for us. Pretty close. And I'm very fond of this old oscilloscope, the Tektronix 454A. It's only got a small display, but it's pin sharp. It's really nice. It's got to be 50 years old. And on the next shelf is the audio analyzer, an HP 8903A. Could just give this an input, and it tells you what you need to know about it. 0.354 volts RMS. And we can even look at the distortion level on it just by push of a button. There we go. 0.1%. And now we're moving on to the RF equipment. This is a signal generator. This is an HP 8657B. This will do about two gigahertz. I mainly use this for testing and calibrating radio receivers. And the spectrum analyzer is an HP 8566B. This is an absolute beast. This thing will measure from 100 hertz to 22 gigahertz. It's got a very good dynamic range, shall we say. And on top it's got the Quasi Peak adapter, which is ideal for uh, EMC testing, which is of course what I had it for. And if nothing else, you can listen to the radio on it. But that'd make it one very expensive radio. <laughs> And continuing the RF equipment, we have the sweep oscillator, an 8350B from Hewlett Packard. This one's actually got a 20 gigahertz module plugged in. This can be used in conjunction with the frequency counter, because this is microwave stuff, so you can't use any old BNC cable with these, you need some pretty chunky cable. Suffice to say, it doesn't get a lot of use. And the last of the test equipment is this Tektronix TDS754D. Four channel oscilloscope. This one gets quite a lot of use. Now for soldering irons, I use uh, Metcal equipment. I've got a desoldering tool, the DS1, which is pretty useful, and a standard handheld soldering iron. Nice and light. I like these. The irons come with a lot of fast change tips, so you can just change these for getting off like QFP chips there, surface mount stuff, big chisel tips, massive tips. Very fine needle ones if you want to do surface mount stuff. The downside is they're both controlled into the same control unit, so I can only actually have one on at a time. Generally I'm using hot air for surface mount soldering. I'm using a quick 861DW hot air station here. 
they did have to extend the tube quite a lot, about six foot in total. That works really well, I can reach both benches with it. And the last thing to show you is the microscope. It's on this stand so it actually reaches both workbenches just nicely. It's got this camera built in so you can see what I'm looking at as well. But it took quite a lot of effort to get the camera to work in the right way with the optics so you could see what I see. That was quite a faff. That's changed pretty much all of the lenses. So this scope is like a no-brand Chinese model, similar to an Amscope I think. Um, it's standard it came with a 0.5 Barlow lens, so that's changed that to a 0.3. And that's because I'm using a 035 times lens for the camera. I have to machine a special mount here to get it down low enough. Then I'm using 15 times eyepieces in this. I changed all the lenses, gave me a good working height, and also means that you see what I see. And that is a good 5 centimetres field of view. Well, I think I've shown you everything there is. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> I'll be back with more repairs next week. Catch you next time.